Galatians 3. And I do have a paper we're going to pass out in a minute. But So, you know, just a, a big easy point that I want us to not mess with this Galatians stuff. And, and i got to just tell you, I'm learning this. And I knew I wanted to teach Galatians like last fall. I was like, man, I think Galatians is our next study. And what's so good about God is like when you... When you learn something the first time, you learn it, and then what he does is, it's not that he's teaching you new things, he's teaching you new things about the stuff you already knew. Or he's showing how much more bigger and broader it is. So like faith, the message of faith, that's the goal of Galatians, is to get our hearts wrapped around how um, dynamically powerful the faith of God is, the faith in God is. So I'm learning too. I'm really going on, an, on a journey. I've got a book um, called The Inward Kingdom, and it's really helping me learn some of these things. But at the same time, the exercise of faith is an exercise. It's a muscle. And I need that muscle grown, and wow. <laughs> I think we all have picked that up in this study. Is, wow, God, like, exercise me in my faith, my trust in you, my belief in you. You know, and, and it is, it is. And, and right when you thought you had faith in God and trust in God, he finds a new place to exercise you, you know? So, um, so what we're doing with Galatians is we are just walking it through, and sometimes it's better to just kind of study the verses that pop out. Um, but then you also don't learn the book of the Bible. So I want us to also know Galatians. So I want to kind of not let us miss out on Galatians as we go. We're just going to read a small section today and just go over a small section, and we're going to have some fun with it too. So start in Galatians 2, uh, 19, okay? So 2, 19, here we go. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Oh, you can just go there right now. Everybody gets it. Um, Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified too. Let me ask you this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness, Know then that it is those who of faith who those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. Stop. Seven. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. Guys, let me just preach this one moment. We would much rather be of faith than of anything else. <laughs> those who are of faith are the sons of Abraham. Okay, so in order for us to get the most out of this, what I've got is, uh, there's, there's different translations of the Bible. Some make it easier. Some are more like super literal, super duper literal. And then it's kind of like you got to have a college degree to know the words that they're talking about. But then there's this other translation called the Amplified that is so fun. Because what it does is it just expands all of the verb tenses, it expands all of the uh, um, clauses, and the, it pulls out the dynamic meaning of the context. And so it's actually longer, but it's actually in some ways easier and more explanatory. So let me get myself set up here a second. And so now we're going to read most of this again, but from the amplified version, okay? So, here we go. Having begun by the Spirit, are we perfected by the flesh? Galatians 3, Amplified Version. Let me ask you this one question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit as the result of obeying the law and doing its works? Or was it by hearing the message of the gospel and believing? 
Was it from observing a law of rituals or from a message of faith? Are you so foolish and so senseless and so silly, having begun your new, spirit, new life spiritually with the Holy Spirit, are you now reaching perfection by dependence on the flesh? Ah, feels good, eh? Have you suffered so many things and experienced so much all for nothing to no purpose, if it really is to no purpose and in vain? Then does he who supplies you with his marvelous Holy Spirit and works powerfully and miraculously among you do so on the grounds of your doing what the law demands or because of your believing in and adhering to and trusting in and relying on the message that you heard. Thus Abraham believed in and adhered to and trusted in and relied on God and it was reckoned and placed to his account and credited as righteousness, as conformity to the divine will in purpose, thought, and action. Know and understand that it is really the people who live by faith who are the true sons of Abraham. Can we just read the title again? Anyone here struggling with themselves? <laughs> Don't worry, guys. The message of the Bible is not work harder. Try harder. Having begun by the Spirit, are you going to find it in you to get perfection? After reading all this, I'm fairly sure it's myself doing everything. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that mystery of the balance. So what we're going to do is circle the correct answer. So if you have a pen or if you don't have a pen, mentally circle it. This is not necessary to physically circle it. But let's just go through these. We're going to start with number one. I am going to comment on number one and number two, and then we're just going to read three to six. Number one. Are we saved from the judgment of God by our good deeds, our religious works, or by faith in Christ? Verse 3. So let's read verse 3. Are you so foolish and so senseless and so silly, having begun your new life spiritually with the Holy Spirit, are you now reaching perfection by dependence on the flesh? Oh, let's put, let's put verse 3. I'm supposed to put verse 2. Whoops! Verse 2! <laughs> okay. Verse 2, let me ask you this one question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit as a result of obeying the law and doing its works, or by hearing the message of the gospel and believing it? Was it from observing a law of rituals or a message of faith? So how are we saved? Is it by our good deeds, our religious works, or by faith in Christ? Okay, and the big point in this one, obviously, is you can't do anything to earn a salvation from the judgment of God. There's nothing you can do. There's no effort that you can execute be it religious or good works or whatever that can get you right with God enough to make that judgment day go well for you. Because in the end, he's going to have the crimes that you committed. It's not like your good things are going to outweigh the crimes. But, you know, Jeffrey Dahmer, you know, Charles Manson, you know, they go and they do all these great deeds. Does that mean that they didn't kill those people? <laughs> well, they still got to get punished for the things they did. So there's no escaping the judgment. You can't do anything to get yourself out of the judgment. So, God's grace is that he saves us by faith alone. Two, two, number two. Are we more right with God when we are doing religious works or when we are resting in faith? Uh, verse two again. So, let's just read it one more time. We want to get this in our heads. Let me ask you this one question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit as a result of obeying the law and doing its works? Or was it by hearing the message of the gospel and believing it? Was it from observing a law of rituals or a message of faith? Go to verse... Uh, Six, six. Thus Abraham believed in and adhered to and trusted in and relied on God, and it was reckoned in place to his account and credited as righteousness, as conforming to the divine will and purpose of God. How did Abraham get right with God? By faith. By belief. By trust. So number two, are we more right with God when we're doing religious works or when we're resting in faith? So number three, are we more pleasing to God when we are trying to not sin, or more engaged with good deeds, or when we're resting in faith? Okay, can I rephrase this one? Are we more pleasing to God? What would make God happy? How can I make God happy? I just want to make God happy. Okay, well, the answer is verse seven. 
Know and understand that it is really the people who live by faith who are the true sons of Abraham. Can we just talk about Abraham for one second? Abraham is called the friend of God. Sounds like they had a pretty good relationship. How did Abraham get this great relationship? There was no law that he could follow even. There was no Ten Commandments. This is 400 years before all that. All Abraham could do was walk by faith in a relationship with God. And he was called the friend of God. And how do you become in that same position as Abraham, the sons of Abraham? By the same way Abraham got it. Just by faith. He who lived before there was the Ten Commandments. He who lived before there were laws to follow to make God happy. God was happy with Abraham. How do I make God more pleasing? Pleased with me? Trusting in a trusting relationship. A believing relationship. Okay, and then let's, let's go to number four. Does God move more powerfully when we act out religious works or when we are resting in faith? Now this one's interesting. Verse 5, verse 5, here we go. Then does he who supplies you with his marvelous Holy Spirit and works powerfully and miraculously among you do so on the grounds of your doing what the law demands or because you're, of your believing in and adhering to and trusting and relying on the message that you heard? How does God move the Spirit through a group of Christians on the basis of their religious works? or on the basis of their faith. Can we just say that again? How do we get more Holy Spirit? <laughs> okay, next one. Uh, number five. Will we be transformed? I, myself, will we be transformed when we are engaged in works? Or when we are engaged in faith. Verse 3. Are you so foolish and so senseless and so silly, having begun your new life spiritually with the Holy Spirit, are you now reaching perfection by dependence on the flesh? Having begun your new life spiritually with the Holy Spirit, are you now reaching perfection by dependence on the flesh? On one hand, we know that salvation is by faith. That makes sense, that if I'm going to go before a judge and he's going to convict me of my crimes. Nothing I can do can erase my crimes. So by, on the basis of faith in Christ, I would be pardoned from those crimes because of Jesus' death on the cross. On my behalf. He died a criminal's death. I was a criminal. He takes my place. I'm covered. That part, you know, it makes sense. But there's something inside of me, and I think there's something inside of humans that he had to write this, that after we put our faith in Jesus, we're pretty sure that we need to take it over again. And there's now these requirements on us. Yes, we understand that God saved me by grace through, his, through faith in Him. But now, in order to finish this journey, I'm going to have to pull myself up by my bootstraps. I have to grab that steering wheel. I'm going to have to engage in religiousness. And that's how we finish this race. Paul's point. Can we just read the title again? Just read the title, which is a quote. Having begun by the Spirit. Paul asks us, are we perfected by the flesh? The same faith that saved us from that judgment moment with the Lord is actually the same faith that perfects us in this journey with Christ. He's dealing with this very tendency in my heart to take over Paul. So then, number six, number six. So then we, we already did this, so we're just doing it again. How do you get more of the Holy Spirit by, the Spirit by engaging in more works or by living in faith? Okay. So, the bold right there. God wants us to believe that belief is enough. God wants us to believe that belief is enough. Yeah, Charlie. You know, I, I guess this is kind of a stupid question. Nope. But, are we just an experiment? <laughs> It sounds like God is trying different things here, you know, and, and oh. why why bother? <laughs> I guess is my question. I had those thoughts too myself. <laughs> and it causes them so much trouble. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, why Which different 
things would you say, because an experiment is I tried this, it didn't work, I tried that, it didn't work, I tried this, it doesn't work. So which things would you think are in the categories of experiment number one, two, and three? Well, I don't know, but he's gone back to, to level one again, so. <laughs> okay, okay. What if something I have eaten and we messed up immediately? <laughs> it's a fair question. It's it's taking the tree away. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. What do you got down in that comment we had to hand up? We were saying that all the same thing. In a way, you'd almost reckon the angels were experimenting because a third of them failed. Okay, okay, okay. So experiment number one in this, in this two would have experimental been idea. Adam and Eve in the garden. Three would have been, I guess, uh, Noah in the ark in the world of fell pieces there, and there was only one. Here's a great question. What day is today? Father's Day. Okay, I'm, I'm not saying this as a joke, but sometimes you kind of get the impression when you have a lot of kids that your first one is your trial and error one. <laughs> and by the time the last one comes, you're pretty relaxed. You're kind of comfortable with this whole thing. Have you ever, have you ever <laughs> Does that mean you don't love child number one? Does that mean you don't love child number two? Does that mean that you didn't have the best intention child number three? No, no, you're learning, you're making your mistakes on child number one. No, but, no, but okay, but then what you're showing then is God's infallible. Because we as individuals are infallible, we are learning and uh, Yo, you, you you're saying God, God is, is learning? learning? Okay, so, 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 <laughs> that doesn't, that's a fathering point, right? Yeah. So as a father, obviously, we're gonna not go where God is fallible, but, that would also take away the indication that he's not loving. God is loving. With the angels, absolutely. He loves them. They are families of heaven, Ephesians 3 calls them. God absolutely loves the angels. Does God love Adam and Eve? Absolutely. Does God love us? Absolutely. The point, though, as we're going to get to, I won't let you, is I've got, a, I've got an illustration that's going to show what his whole point was. And I will bring that out before we're done. I think it will answer it. I want to make sure we wrap that one up. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw it together a certain way, because God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. That's what I say is take on it. I saw Sylvia first, didn't I? Because that goes, but that still goes with uh, free will. So God is perfect. He is our Father, but we have free will. And he gave it to us before Adam and Eve had eaten from the fruit. But he did not, he knew what we were going to do, but he was hoping that we were not going to take advantage of the free will and that we were going to eat from the fruit, of the, fruit, from the fruit of the tree. So that brings back to also Cain and Abel, and all the destruction, and then the flooding, that became of the flooding, and then of the Jews. He knew that the Jews were going to turn the backs on Jesus, and, and on him, and so that's free will, right? The angels so, have free will. And angels, right, I was going to say that too. Yeah. Yes, the angels have free will too. <coughs> so it's all free will. Why did he give us free will? That's another. Because oh, I can exactly just so sure. I hate it. I hate no, it. I can tell you. Myself. I can tell you. Why? Why did you? Try Actually, that's a sign it's of so hard. that's a sign of maturing. Is when you decide, God, I don't like my free will. Can you just take it over? Yeah. yeah. I, I, no, I can I answer why free will. Because frustrating. Song of Solomon eight. You cannot buy love. That means you also can't manufacture love. Yeah. Love is love if it is given freely. Oh, so that's why he gave free will. You can't have real love unless Psalm, it is Psalm in the context eight. of freedom. Song of Songs 8, Song of Psalm 8, verse 6. Man cannot give all of his wealth for love. He would despise it. That is a huge point. And can I just talk parenting for a second? Father's Day parenting? This is the biggest struggle I have. Katie's 15, she's pretty well growing up. 15? Growing up. What I'm saying is, with the two year old and the five year old, it is so tricky to not force them into Christianity. Do you need help? Isn't that interesting? They have to choose to love God, no matter what I would like them to do, or manipulate them through Christian videos. In the end, they're going to have to choose God. Parents, doesn't that kind of scare your heart a little bit? That your kids are going to have to have their own choice and they could choose to not love God? Oh, I just won't have any kids. Uh, that doesn't work either, does it? 
So the God's in that same point, Father God. If he's going to have any genuine love at all, he has to risk. But he's perfect love with Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Yeah, the thing he is, pretty good at the beginning. <laughs> the thing is, though, you're you're comparing us to God and, and this Father thing. We're not. We, we don't compare. So, I mean, going back to level one again, if God is so perfect and God knows all, you should be able to see all this and then skip all these points. <laughs> Ah, you're going for Charlie. You don't understand why was there so much time between the fall to when Christ came. You know, why didn't he just have Christ come right away? You know, why why have to go through whatever he goes through? But I think that's part of the beauty of, well, God, I, I don't understand your ways, and your ways are higher than mine. And I don't understand why you let everything happen and judges happen. Like, I hate that book. <laughs> well, that's the easy you know? way out, though. But no, it's not the easy way out. Because I want to figure it all out. And it's hard to go, God, I'm going to trust you with this. And I, I'm going to surrender my thoughts to you on this. And no, he, he knew back in Jeremiah, or I think it's Jeremiah or Isaiah, where, you know, all the prophesies, he, he knew what he was going to do. Why was there so much time? I don't know, to God, a day is like, you know, a thousand years or whatever. <laughs> and so he's outside of time. But I don't know, like, there's part of it that allows us to have a beautiful picture of, of the value of the cross on this side, because we got to see all the Jewish history leading up to it. But it's a good question, Charlie, and it's one of those that I think God lets us think on it to draw us to draw us into his thoughts. Like, God, why? Why? And to ask him and to sit with him in those whys, and then go with him with what he shows. Like, for me, it was, well, I'm going to trust you with this one. <laughs> well, I guess, I guess my other question then would be, um, as he's going along here, is he not interested in people uh, uh, becoming, a, a, how should we say, uh, worshiping him or, or falling in line with him or whatever, as opposed to uh, being a bunch of lost souls? I mean, the majority of oh, people yeah. are going to wind up to be lost souls. I mean, be very few that probably uh, come through this, and, and you know. So, so uh, I'm, I'm trying to see what his point is here. <laughs> John four, John four. Jesus is talking to the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman at the well, and it's there that he says, "The Father is seeking true worshipers who will worship Him in spirit and in truth." The Father is seeking true worshipers. And I would say that one of the dynamics of a true worshiper, one of the dynamics of true worshipers, is the free will to choose to worship. So you have then that requirement of him to produce free will, to allow free will in a creation. Because then that also supplies the soil for true worshipers. Well, I don't know. It just seems that we've... Uh, we've gone through an evolution of different different processes and we're back to square one again so like what's the point I guess is what I'm my question well, well we're not and back at square we, one in that sense because we're at the square of having Christ coming in with us so that's not the same as well yeah that's true we, we have right? Christ now what do we yeah. and so now yeah. like everything is centered around that <laughs> and now it's like what will each person choose to do with yeah. Which, which kind of leads to my point again. He must look at it as a failed project to bring to send Christ down. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil was set opposite the tree of life. So Adam and Eve did not I have to fail. See you, I see you. There was no requirement of them to fail. They didn't, have to. they didn't have to. So yeah, that could have been plan A that just kept developing, eating the tree of life, which pretty much every commentator says that represents Christ, a life outside of theirs, Christ. We could have just been on this beautiful golden slope. And the free will choice was between the two trees. So now, yeah, we are in a recovery because it is called the fall. And scripture calls it the fall. It is we left our original intention and the return to that original intention requires a new tree of life. Well, what did Jesus die on? It was intentionally chosen to be a piece of wood stuck in the air like a tree. That was deliberate. We're meant to see that. Is the tree of life is once again available for choice. 
and, and Moses even frames it in the law to the Israelites. I set before you today the choice between life and death. Choose life. Adam and Eve had this choice. Tree of life, knowledge of good and evil, which will kill you. He told them. Choose life. Now Jesus comes along. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. He's saying, choose life. So we're, we're always given this choice is there. The word choice is used in Moses and in Jesus. Choice. And in that choice, I know that I am responding out of my free will. And then God, that is pleasing to him. I know we're not totally done talking about that, but I think we wrapped it up enough to bring on our next points, which is, that brings us back to what faith is. Faith is the total expression of love and trust and giving over of my will to God is faith. It's, it's, it's expressed in, in simple faith. Which, uh, I'm going to bring out the pot of plants at this point. Okay. I have here a pot. Okay. And inside is dirt. Okay. So, I'm needing to make sure I follow my own notes. Get forgetful of me. Now, what do you do with a pot? of dirt. Put flowers, plants, okay? What is it for? Life. Explain it a bit more. Life, uh, dirt is dead, and God wanted to increase life. Right, it's a, it's a vessel for life. Yeah. It holds, holds life in it, okay? So if you have uh, soil, good soil, this is the Bible talk about the four soils, good soil versus rocks, okay? When you have good soil, then that soil can take a seed. A seed has life in it. And in this seed is all of the information that it needs to become any kind of plant. The plant that, it is, that it's made to be, right? This could be, a, this could be anything from a carrot to a mustard tree, right? Or an apple tree or whatever. Okay? Whatever the seed is will produce it. So, the pot's role is to contain life. What's the seed's job? Just to grow in light, to be what it is. And then what's my hand represent? What do I represent? The gardener. You guys remember John 15 when Jesus says, My father is the vine dresser, and I'm the vine, and you're the branches. If you abide in me, you'll bear much fruit. Okay, why would a gardener plant a seed? Forget flowers for a second. We're going to talk about things that are fruit-bearing, because John 15 especially speaks of fruit, right? Why would a gardener plant... This is a bean. Why would a, God, why would a gardener plant a bean seed? To get more beans. <laughs> <laughs> to get more beans! It's not complicated! <laughs> because the point of planting a vegetable is that it will produce... Here we go, there's our cute little seed. That it will produce the plant that it was designed to produce and that that plant hey, Mommy, will produce the fruit. Okay, does the pot produce fruit? Does the soil produce fruit? It has its role, but it's ultimately the plant that comes from the seed. What is the pot's job in fruit production? Hold the water that helps to give life. Hold the soil. Okay? This pot's obligation is to be a vessel. So the gardener plants the seed that pleases him, and the gardener is expecting that the plant will produce a, a plant, right? The seed will produce a plant which will overtake the pot and overshadow the pot. Who here has flowers and, and plants in pots? Okay? When people come in to your home or to your garden, do they say, what a lovely pot. Where did you get that pot? There's this huge, beautiful flowering bush, gorgeous with its petals and its green, deep life, and they say, what a lovely pot. <laughs> Get 
great. If it's the only thing to look at, they might say, wow, that would really work out on that colorful pot. That actually happened to our white pot in the back there. That's a nice pot. <laughs> yeah, because the pants were yeah, missing. Okay. Can anyone else pick up where we're going here? See what's going on here? God's the gardener. What he's gardening is plant, seed, to produce fruit. He needs, he's looking for a vessel. Didn't 2 Corinthians call us a jar of clay? I'm a jar of clay to show that the power that's within me is not from us, but from God. God takes seed. What does the seed represent? The seed represents Christ. Christ. He's called the seed through the entire Old Testament. Starting with Eve, God gives the promise that in your seed, Eve, will come one who will crush the serpent's head. And then that phrase is used through the rest of the Old Testament until Jesus, who comes into a woman as a... Okay, this is not gross. This is the way it is. He was planted as a seed inside of a womb, inside of a vessel of life. And then from uh, that vessel came, that woman came a full-grown person. But then God came in as a spirit. As we hear the word, and we are good soil, Jesus comes in by spirit and plants himself inside of us as a vessel. And then what does the Father want to come out of our vessel? The seed. The seed. Can I, can I say this again? What God wants to come out of the vessel is the seed. Gardeners, you don't plant seeds to make the pot look pretty. You plant the seed because you want it to produce a, a, a branch and a vessel, a branch and a, and, and a fruit bearing plant of some sort. God is after the same thing. The joy in the journey of being a jar of clay is you get to participate in another person's life. <laughs> you get to participate. You're not the life. You're just the vessel. You don't have the ability to produce fruit. Anyone here have the ability to produce the fruit of God within themselves? No. But God does. And all, all, all God's after is that we would be a willing vessel. What happens is, as pots, we get a little stuck on our ability to do things. Because we are not just pots. We are people. And we can do things. And what it does is it creates the confusion of when we talk about works. Because this passage is talking about works. This whole book is talking about works. Because the human being can do. The word works is the word energy in the Bible. Energon is where energy is. A human being can exert energy. So we're pretty sure that we have some value before God because we can exert energy and do things. So we're pretty sure that we can go and do lots of good things or religious things or quality things and that somehow that's what God wants. And it's not to say he's going to get to the end that there's not a place for, for the works of the, of, the, of the vessel. But what that's missing is, what is the work that God really is after? The work is the work that only he can do. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, I planted... Right? He preached the gospel. I planted a seed in you, Corinthians. Another guy came along and watered it. He taught them more about Christ. But what does he say in 1 Corinthians 3? But God caused the growth. If what the gardener, hear me now, if what the gardener really wants is more of this plant, what work can the pot do to help that? By having faith. Faith alone. And that, and that was thinking, choice. That's what it's supposed to be that Faith alone. Well, you're choosing yeah. faith. Yeah. You're choosing faith, not choosing works. Right. It's a belief issue. Do you believe that your works will help that plant grow? If this plant could go plant five orphanages, do we believe that it'll develop the tree in us? Can, I, can you hear me say that? I'm not saying don't plant orphanages. If I believe that planting orphanages will make this tree grow, I'm wrong. Can we hear that? Can we hear that? If I believe that helping a hundred neighbors 
and being kind to everyone I meet will help this plant grow. Do you hear what I'm saying? Will it help the plant grow? The answer is no. Only God can cause this fruit of life to develop and produce the seed that he is. As he gets into it, he's not saying don't do good things. He's not saying don't be active in good works. What he's saying is, where are you being perfected, completed, finished? Only in the context of faith. Only by faith. The work of God is accomplished by faith. I'm going to distinguish that one more time and then we're done with this. If I think that the work God is after is more good deeds or more religious effort, if I think that that's the work God wants, I'm deceived in the sense that I've become a foolish Galatian, a silly Galatian. I think that what God wants to finish us by is my good deeds. The only thing that can finish what God wants is faith. To allow Jesus Christ, the seed, to be fully formed in us. So faith in life grows more fruit. It's the faith in the life of Christ that produces the fruit that God has actually got. So this whole experiment, I'll call it an experiment with you, but I'll use it in quotes, is to find those who will simply be a vessel for his son. So that's what I mean by experiment, though, because, because uh, he could have started with, with Christ right at the beginning. He did start with Christ, but he didn't have Christ in a vessel. Have, yeah. so, I mean, so the vessel part is the work. Of course he's got Christ. Christ is complete. Oh yeah, I know that, that part. But I'm taking that, Christ. But he wouldn't come, come to earth this time. Like, so he didn't have a crucifixion. But I mean, that's one of what I'm saying is, how come we've got thousands of years of wasted time? I think that's my question. That's a disappointment to all of us. <laughs> Oh, that's, that's, that's basically what I'm asking. Is why, why didn't he just bring that right into the beginning? Well, I can tell you the short version is Adam and Eve were the original plan. There was the fall. With the fall came the necessity to judge sin and produce life again. So the law, the Mosaic law, came in, as Romans and Galatians will teach us, the law came in just to, just to prove that everybody was a sinner so that judgment could come to all people equally. So the law, it wasn't an experiment to see what would happen. The law was already in, indicated to not be able to produce life. The law cannot produce life. The Ten Commandments can't produce life, but it can judge everyone who's dead and declare to everyone equally that everyone is dead. Then from that soil of everyone accepting their death, God can plant the seed of life by faith. And that in that life, that seed, then he's back on track. Back into the tree of life. The, the goal of what he was aiming to do. <coughs> man, the vessel for his son. Short version, but that's pretty much so what had to happen. Say, you're basically saying we're the lucky ones. There is a place where we should be glad and grateful for... Our, and the Bible affirms it. Be grateful. Be glad. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So just to wrap this up, I already went over these things, so that now they're written out. But uh, go to the now the potted plant, okay? And now the potted plant. Just as it is idiocy to believe that we can help a seed by our efforts, so too God says that his servants plant in water, but only he can cause the growth. So circle on the left. Are we begun by the spirit? So are we perfected by the flesh? Circle on the right. Are we begun by faith? So are we completed by what we do? Is God going to bring to completion the goal that he has for us by our fleshly works? No. God is going to bring to completion by faith and his spirit. Ultimately, because what he's building with us is of a spiritual nature. Well, I'm of the flesh. The only thing spiritual I have in me is Christ. So faith alone is that means by which God can use it. So let's, let's read the last bottom paragraph. 
What does the gardener want when he plants a seed? More of the plant. So if the pot goes out and starts five orphanages, is that what the gardener wanted? To clear about this, we usually make the good things the point. No, the gardener wants the plant. We make it about the fruit. He makes it about the vine. We make it about the works. He makes it about the sun. So what does God want from me? Jesus. How can he get it from me? By fill in the blank. And the simplicity of God's plan is kept in place. So the Alpha and Omega and the Gospel of God's plan is the way it is. He has a beginning and he has an end. So that's why, again, yeah, everything has to go like this. So now, so there's still more to go right here. Do we ever do anything without thinking of the end in mind? Not usually, right? We've got gardens. We, we plot out our garden, right? We don't just plant seeds. Well, let's put a tomato here and put a bean beside it and put a carrot to its left. We do, but <laughs> usually you plot it out. You just think about the seeds. end, oh, gosh, what can and then that helps do? you begin right. Connor just did a whole bunch of coding. You just designed, you had to envision your final program, how it would look and work in your mind, and then your coding came one line at a time to accomplish the end. So here we are in the middle of a process. God began with his end in mind. Everything is in its place intentionally. Is everything going the way he wants? Free will? No. But everything that has happened from the beginning was begun with the end in mind. What we do is we're very careful with what Galatians is teaching us. We don't get distracted by these works that we hear of in Christianity or in Judaism. We stay focused that what God's end is is only accomplishable by spirit, which is our part of faith. And that keeps us on the right track, what Galatians is saying. Stay in the right track of the end, which is faith. We're going to read in Galatians 4. Oh, I'm going to get in labor that Christ be formed in you. Okay? He wants Christ formed in you. So God starts us with a seed of Christ, but that does not mean that the thing has grown. It only grows by faith. Okay, that's our summary to wrap up. Any, any other questions? Any other? Yeah, this, this is, is good. good. It's good. Yeah. We were talking about Jackie Dollar and uh, Charlie's Madison. This God still have that. Yeah, yeah, so the criminal on the cross. Jesus died, there was a thief on one side and a murderer on the other. And, and one looked on him with faith and said, uh, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. So the man on his dying breath put his faith in Jesus and his sins were forgiven. He was pardoned of all evil. Did Jesus have love for him back when he was a sinner? We know that from Romans 5. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And that demonstrated his love for us. But then God couldn't give that love to the person until they turned to him in faith. Yeah, he has to do his Yes, the turning yeah, yeah, actually, the shack is free. The reality, though, is whatever love God may have for the angels and demons, um, they are not, according to Scripture, going to be redeemed in any sense. No. They have their... They chose their path. They, they have to live with them. Yeah, it's a little bit different discussion yeah. entirely. That's a good question, though. Like, do you still love them? Of course, you still love them, but you have to be doing this choice and it's free will. Well, we know as a father the different hats we have to wear. Sometimes we're the fishing father. Yeah. You know, let me tie that thing on there. Good job, son. And then sometimes we're the uh, disciplinary father. Yeah, you just hit your brother. Yeah, so there's a punishment. We don't hit in this house. You know? So depending on what hat he's got to wear, that's a different discussion about the angel. Okay. Is this an interesting subject? Is this is this important? Is this valuable? 
I'm really, just so you guys know, I'm really being exercised on this one. I am. I said it at the beginning, but I'm saying it again. I'm being exercised on my religiousness, right? The doing of the great deeds, the doing of the obedience, and there is obedience to Christ, of course, but I, I'm getting all re-scrambled. It's helping me, but it's re-scrambling me around what God's really looking for will come only by faith. It doesn't mean we're not engaged in the things that are in front of us, and he's going to get into that by the end, but there's this place where it really does just begin in the simplest faith. And if I overcomplicate what God's doing by my religious expectations, or putting those religious expectations on other people, my children, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to scramble it for them too. All God's after is a simple trust of a seed. So we're going to water the plant, and maybe by the end of Galatians we'll see a sprout. Okay, I am going to sing this one song. I'm going to sing this song. I know we're going along, but we had a good discussion. We're just going to sing a couple lines of one song.